I have B.F. Randall here. I live in Utah and I'm now on my 30 years since I graduated from law school. I really like science and technology, and but I, I'm not very good at math. So that's kind of how I ended up in law school. But given my interest in technology and, and science, I ended up having opportunities to do things that I like to do. And I ended up in environmental law and energy law and had great opportunities to work for uh, for various firms. So, you know, for, for some period of time, I was at one of the world's largest energy firms. And just, I saw a lot of, a lot of transactional work, a lot of energy regulatory work, M&A work, that kind of thing. So that's kind of my, my background. Um, I've been doing regulatory work for almost 30 years, environmental energy type work in that field. You're kind of going viral on Twitter and on Substack, right? You're getting a lot of traffic out there, a lot of interest. Yeah, I, I haven't, I was really active in, you know, the last maybe six months. I've kind of toned it down lately because I just don't have time and I've kind of exhausted what I can, you know, but yeah, I was very active on, twi on Twitter and, and Substack. I, I created the substantial Substack library, all free of charge. I just, there's so much disinformation and lack of understanding about how, how energy systems work and energy technology. And it's the most important topic facing humanity. There, there's no doubt about it. I mean, apart from climate change issues, I'm just talking about the dung market in, in India is valued at $4 billion. 2.3, 2.5 billion people, human beings on this planet rely on dung and such to cook their food. It's all about energy, right? Humanity needs energy. We, we consume vast amounts of energy and the way that we're doing it is not is far from ideal. In India, it's it's widespread because they don't, again, they, they don't have the forests and the trees and they collect cow dung and make it into fuel to, to cook their food. One of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast is so that people would know about your Twitter feed and your Substack. So I put both of those in the show notes. Did you want to show us some of your Substack work on this podcast here? Yeah, I've spent yeah. quite a bit of time putting this together. I did this on my own, so pardon, there, there are some... Sometimes some errors and it's free of charge. So, you know, you kind of get what you pay for, but let me, yeah, let me just walk through bfrandall.substack.com. I just kind of brought up some of my feeds. I have this feed called Dr. Rizik's Energy Academy. I think this is a really good starting place for people who maybe don't know that much about energy and, and how it works. This is kind of my playlist. So Dr. Rizik is a professor at University of Illinois at Champaign. Illinois. He's a nuclear power physicist or nuclear physicist. He has forgotten more about energy than I'll ever know. He created a series of free YouTube lectures and with the support of the university, he put them all up on, on YouTube. I've kind of created my own playlist, where, you know, kind of starting from, you know, an introduction down through fundamentals about what is energy, you know, how does just fundamental elementary kinds of things. This is just my playlist. But if you want to know more about this field, I just really recommend going through this. He talks about what is electrical energy. This is where we go off track because electrical energy is not, it's not a commodity. It's not something we can just produce. You know, it's not like, you know, wheat. You can't just produce it and put it in a silo and have it be available when you need it. It is a service. Electrical energy on the grid is a service. And he, he talks about basics of nuclear nuclear fission, how it works. He talks about, he has three really good lectures on radiation. I've actually done quite a bit of radiation control work in my career. This is all excellent stuff. Kind of the relative risks of, of how radiation works, because, you know, we kind of have this, you know, humanity kind of has this collective fear about radiation and so forth. It has, a, it has this whole lecture about the uranium fuel cycle, which is excellent. He talks about enrichment. <laughs> Again, you know, th there's a lot of detail here. He talks about, oh, this is a good one, the economics of a nuclear reactor. Just how, in a nuclear reactor, you it is so capital intensive, it's very hard to compare the economics with anything else because the fuel costs are so low. The fuel costs, because of the way fission works, it's so low that it's all it, it, it it's a capital intensive project the other thing is a nuclear reactor 
the current ones that are, that are being planned, we're talking about a something that's on the scale of like a hydro plant. Like these will work for up to like a hundred years, and with with refurbishments, it could even it could be indefinite. That, that's what we're finding. You don't have to tear down the whole reactor infrastructure. You just have to refurbish. You know, kind of like changing the engine in a car. Like even after sixty years, change the engine. Now you have another 60 years going. It's really hard to compare that kind of a capital investment because of 100 years, over a, over 100 years compared to anything else. The economic models don't even work that far. He has this great lecture on nuclear waste. He talks about high-level waste, which is really used fuel. He talks about reprocessing like they do in France. This is a good one that I recommend. In the nuclear power technology field, there are different generations of reactors. And right now, all the reactors that are being built are at least what's called Gen 3, Generation 3 reactors, which are considered to be passively safe. So reactors that are, that you know, a Fukushima Daiichi situation will never happen with a Gen 3 reactor because it does not require any outside inputs to maintain it, you know, it, its safety. So it's internally safe, it's passively safe. So Gen 4 reactors are even better because not only are they passively safe, Gen 4 reactors get into especially the high temperature, non-light water reactor technologies, which is where we humans have not even scratched the surface of the surface of the surface of what nuclear power can do for humanity. Because up till now, all we've been doing with nuclear power is we're using very low enrichments on a once on a once through fuel cycle to boil water or to make steam to make electricity, which itself is only I'm going to get my numbers wrong, but it thermally it's highly inefficient because of the way light water reactors work. Not only do we have a phase change in steam and and all of that going on, but we have to keep the reaction very moderated because we we're operating at temperatures of like 250 C, 260 C. We can't be hotter than that. Even though a nuclear reactor wants to run naturally, would want to run about 500 C or hotter and safely, with, but because there's water involved and, and water thermally decomposes into hydrogen and oxygen, and there's an explosion risk, if you take water out of the reactor and you have some other process, we're now we're talking about something that's that's far more safe and far more productive in terms of actual heat output, useful heat that we can use for so many things besides boiling water to make electricity. I've been going through my playlist, but I think this is another high, really important lecture that I'll highlight. And I've written quite a bit about this, this the, the natrium concept. The natrium reactor concept is transformational on many, many levels. And the concept here of using a heat battery was actually created by a nuclear physicist, a PhD physicist named Cal Abel. And Cal came out of the nuclear Navy, and I didn't even know this backstory. I joined Twitter, and I remember when I first saw the natrium, and I, my brain exploded when I realized what this was doing. And I thought that Bill Gates and TerraPower invented this. I thought, man, my dream was to just meet the person who thought of this. I just could not, this is so brilliant. I it just, I'm speechless. And I joined Twitter and I started hearing people tell me, oh, you, you sound like Cal Abel. You should talk to Cal Abel. I'm, Who's Cal Abel? I have no idea who Cal Abel is. So I could, many people started talking to me about Cal Abel. So I, we, I, I, I followed him and we connected. And I find out this whole backstory about natrium, and it go it, and I've written about this on my Substack. So Cal actually is kind of like Ben Franklin. I make I make this analogy in one of my Substack articles that Ben Franklin invented the Franklin stove because it was so much more efficient, you know. And he donated that to humanity. He felt like that was, hey, people have benefited me. I'm not going to take a pat. He was offered a patent on it. In fact, when he went to England and he saw that somebody in England had gotten an English patent on his design, he was furious. So he donated the Franklin stove, the, the idea of using, you know, a steel fireplace, if you will, but basically with baffles and the way the airflow works, the Franklin stove was conserving so much more heat in the home compared to a flute, like a normal fireplace where the heat goes up, like you're losing most of your heat up the chimney. 
Ben Franklin's invention has saved, I mean, it made the United States with, with so much more efficient. It's indescribable how important that invention was. Well, Cal Abel did the same thing. He donated this to humanity. This was his PhD thesis, and he knew that he could get a patent on it, but he kind of didn't have the wherewithal to do it. So he donated this patent to humanity. It became an open source patent, or it wasn't a patent, but it was, when he published this, it became open source. And the Natrium people got a hold of that, and this is one iteration of, of, of Cal Abel's technology, which is basically this. You're going to take a nuclear reactor and pair it with a salt heat tank system. So it's the same heat tank system that's being used in all the concentrated solar operations. You have all the mirrors that, shine, that collect all this thermal energy, right? And it concentrates on a tower, and then that tower heats up salt. It's nitrate salt. This is an off-the-shelf product, but you have a hot tank and a cold tank. So during the day, the you know the sun shines and and it heats up the hot tank and then during the night you know they, they can use that heat to balance it, it boils water but it runs a turbine and then you know as that heat depletes it goes into the cold tank for the next day and then the cycle continues cal took that technology and paired it with a nuclear reactor a non light water nuclear reactor so this is this reactor runs at it's set to run at 500 c and then you scale the reactor down to a 300, well, Natrium scaled it down to a 340 megawatt, but it's paired with a 500 megawatt steam generator. So what happens is on a daily cycle, the reactor runs 95% capacity factor all the time. You don't cycle the reactor. I mean, nuclear reactors just want to run. You just run it. Boring, boring, boring. You heat exchange that into the salt tanks. During the day, you build up the heat in the hot tank or, or during the night, you know, during the op, it doesn't matter. You're just, you're always storing that, that heat. When you put that, you connect that to a 500, a 500 megawatt steam generator, which again, most coal power plant units are 500 megawatt steam generators. Every major coal plant in the, the U.S. or the, in the world, it's a 500 megawatt steam generator. This is off the shelf. You basically take off the steam circuit and plug in natrium to an existing coal plant at the you know the 500 megawatt steam generator, and you're basically you have that on a gas pedal, so that so you can run that steam generator in load following mode. So you know loads go like this, and so you have a you have a heat tank, and you can just run you can run that at 500 megawatts flat out for up to like seven hours a day, and then you back off. You back off, you let the heat build up. So th this technology is just, it's phenomenal. And then I find out that, that the first unit is being planned for my grid, just a few miles from where my daughter lives up in Wyoming. And it's just, it's great. But he goes through this, uh, Ruzik understood the advantages of this technology kind of, I mean, way more than I did. And he created this whole lecture about the nature of technology, which... I think is fabulous. People need to, to watch this. Okay, Chernobyl. He, he gives one of the best lectures I've ever seen on Chernobyl and how it happened and why it happened and why it can never happen again because there was no containment on this reactor. And this reactor was also dual moderated. It was graphite and water moderated. That is a terrible design because it was because the graphite moderated the usually in a light water reactor and he explains this if you if you have an accident and the water the water leaks out then the fission stops because the water is needed to moderate the the neutrons and if you lose your coolant you lose the reaction stops so that was the theory but this is like in this instance they lost the water but the fission kept happening because it was still being moderated by graphite. And it caused, a, again, a hydrogen explosion. All of the nuclear accidents that we know about, that we've heard about, have been hydrogen explosions because it's a light water reactor. And you have to, Fukushima was a hydrogen explosion because, again, in a runaway temperature, water thermally decomposes at about 2000 C into hydrogen and oxygen. In a, in a two to one ratio, which in itself will, you know, that it, there's a lot of thermal energy in that when it when it explodes. So 
And then he goes through some of the health effects of Chernobyl. He gives a great lecture on Fukushima. He gives a great lecture on Three Mile Island, two lectures on Three Mile Island, with three actually three lectures on Three Mile Island. He gives this great lecture on gas cooled reactors. These are these are Gen 4 reactors. So like natrium, natrium is using sodium metal as the, the primary coolant, but the sodium circuit is very short and small because it heat exchanges into the nitrate salt. Um, gas cooled reactors are using helium or other similar gases like noble gases that are non-reactive to as the heat mechanism, the heat exchange mechanism through the reactor. This is really compelling stuff. You know, you've heard maybe you've heard about the the recent announcement by Dow Chemical. It's a gas cooled reactor because again, you're it, it, the gas cooled reactors. You're getting up to like 800 C or 900 C operating temperatures, which is almost all of our industrial processes will work on that kind of a of a scale. Then he's talking about the micro reactors. There's great potential here to scale reactors down to a very small scale. Anyway, I could go on. He talks about how diesel fuel is different than other fuels. And I, I again, I've written about this a lot. A lot of what I've learned, I've learned from people like, I'm just kind of reiterating what I've learned from other people. I mean, I'm very curious. If I could highlight any of my articles that I've ever written that I think gets, well, there's a few that I think deserve attention. I kind of become known as kind of just being negative on wind and solar and batteries because they are absurd contraptions and they are, and they deserve criticism. And there is no place for wind and solar on the grid. I mean, it's absurd. It's absolutely, it, it's a lie. But it, again, we're thinking about this wrong. And I think it, my very first podcast was with the couple with Dr. Keeper, and this is kind of a summary of some of the things I talked about in that first podcast. I don't necessarily recommend it because I was kind of all over the map, but I've got I've got my thoughts straight and straightened out quite a bit. So this isn't this the genesis of this idea actually came, and I'll, I'll get to it. But the the idea is that if you look at this chart, this is just one of many different charts about how energy consumption I was talking about earlier. This is a representation of total energy consumption worldwide between 1965 and 2020. So basically my lifetime. A few notable things from this chart. Electrical energy is only about 20% of, of all energy. Like We are accustomed because of kind of how we see energy. We probably overemphasize how much you know, electrical energy matters. It does matter. I, I don't get me wrong. But if you put every single existing nuclear plant, hydro plant, coal plant, and put them, everything that generates electricity on the whole planet in a bucket, and you measure that energy, it's only about 20%. Every windmill, every solar panel, you put it all in a bucket, it's only about 20% of world energy. It It is, what about 15%, 15 to 20%, it's not even 20%, it's like 15%. What about the 85%, right? What's going on there? Well, that's where the cow dung is, petroleum, you know, all the <laughs> all the biomass that we're burning, that we're depleting soil carbon at astronomical rates because it's good for the environment to burn wood and 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 destroy our forests and deplete the world of of soil carbon that we need for fertility because we're going to save the planet, right? Nutty. Is any nuclear power used just to create the heat without ever going through the step of creating electricity? No. So that's why I say we have not even scratched the scratch of what nuclear power really can do. You know, it's kind of like there's a meme somewhere where it's like, oh, we 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 learned how to split atoms. We we discovered fission. Well what should we do with that? Oh, I know. Let's boil water, <laughs> right? And Because we've been constrained because boiling water has always been the heat transfer mechanism for most heat engines, right? We've kind of been, we, we've limited nuclear power into this 
old model of energy that it doesn't fit in. It, it doesn't. It, it, and I'll get more into that later. But if we look at that, the 85% is really, it, it's processed heat, it's petroleum, it's diesel fuel and jet fuel. If we want to really focus on the energy that matters most to us human beings, it is diesel fuel and jet fuel because those two fuel types do almost all of our work. When I say work, I mean like physical work, like picking things up and moving things around and, and processing things. Like that's the, the kinetic energy that does, that powers our civilization. It's done with diesel fuel and with jet fuel. And those two really cannot be replaced because of the diesel engine and the jet engine are so efficient. There's no way to replace those. It just, it won't work. We can't make an electric powered jet engine like it doesn't work and same with diesel fuel there's no way to decarbonize diesel except if we can make those fuels from non-petroleum sources so you know e-fuels and nuclear power opens up that whole like the use of nuclear power as process heat and i don't even want to say nuclear power i want to say fission the use of fission as the basis to make e-fuels, we again, we haven't even scratched. We haven't even started. This is the future of nuclear of fission energy. It's to attack the whole thing. Fission can, can do all of that. Almost all of that can be done with fission and should be done. Now, if we just look at France, I just posted a uh, thread today there apparently france is starting to take a leadership role in europe now finally because they know how to to decarbonize their grid and provide dependable domestic energy france did this decades ago the mesmer plan but again this is again this is only in the 15 percent. the little 15 percent. look what france did with fission and so Electrical energy should be fission, like worldwide. We should, it, that's the lowest hanging fruit there is. Boil water with it. Like we know how to do this. I don't want to take away from that. It all should be fission. And then I kind of go through some other claims that we hear all the time that are lies, like nuclear power takes too long. Jack Devaney has some great stuff on Substack. It's all free. Japan. This whole idea that nuclear power takes too long to build, it's just, it's a lie. It's only because the antis make it so. The enemies of fission make it, make sure that it is so. They make sure that it takes too long and they make sure that it costs too much because they are trying to wreck it. And then they turn around and they say, oh, look, it costs too much. And it, oh, oh, look. Oh, look, Westinghouse went bankrupt, right? They did it on purpose. This was not... <laughs> It doesn't need to be that way. Here's kind of the point, kind of a perspective thing. So all of that energy, going back to that first chart, all of this energy that the world consumed here this in 2020, from the top to bottom of that chart, if you measure that in, in energy units, total energy units, just a common unit, if you reduce that to a common energy unit, it is 600 exajoules of energy. That's how much humanity consumed in 2020, total, in all, you know, everything. In, India just surpassed China in population, right? For, for India to have the same standard of living as China, India would have to quadruple its energy consumption. So think about how much energy India needs to even to even be at the same standard of living as China. It's it's astronomical how much more. Well. Imagine a world where we, where humanity consumed 1,200 exajoules of energy. Is like how would that even be possible with our current systems? But for fission, is the only way we can actually get here with fission. It's not. It's not that hard. This is, this is not like fusion, which is a fairy tale in t decades. It might happen, maybe. You know, fission is real. We, we know how to do this. It's not. Rocket science. We even know rocket science, but we know this. We're down to the engineering level. We're, this is this is beyond theoretical. We, we've been doing this for decades. I, I kind of this is one meme that I circulate a lot because when we talk about the amount of thermal energy that is in on a unit basis, compare these. Uranium and thorium both are fission fission product or fissionable at least. It's just it's incomparable. 
humanity up till now, we have been stuck in combustion. We have been combusting carbon resources to make low-grade heat and pollution products. Why? We don't need to do this anymore. We can split, we can take an, an abundant low-cost metal like lead that's out in the that's available, and we can split it and we can turn that metal into enormous volumes of thermal energy that we can use. That's what we need. We need thermal energy. We don't need electrical energy. Like wind and solar just make electrical, they make random electrical energy. That That is low, low, low value energy resource. We need thermal energy. So Nick Torin, who ha, he's at what is nuclear, what is nuclear, he posted this meme some time ago that I picked up on this. And it's kind of the basis for, for this article. But he kind of put this in perspective. If, if you look at what he's saying here, if you look at all the metals that we mined in 2020, so going back to the year when that other chart, right? If you look on this, on this, he, he kind of circled right here where the uranium is. You can see that maybe in the his red circle. And this is a hot link. You could, you could, you if you go on Substack, you can click this and you'll bring up this whole thread. This is Knick's point. Hey, in 2020, the world consumed 600 exajoules of energy total. We also mined 48,000 tons of uranium. If we were able to put that re uranium in a fast reactor, so we're not talking about light water reactors, we're talking about recovering all the thermal energy out of that same 48,000 tons. And Nick is a PhD, he, he's very capable. He calculated that that would release three and a half thousand exajoules of thermal energy, like f almost 5x of all the energy the world consumed in that same year. If we could just take that uranium and turn it into a fast reactor, we're at a 5x. So that is like we, we are not thinking about this right. We need to change how we think about energy because this is the way forward for humanity and civilization. This is it. This is the only way forward. Again, part of what I'm trying to do also is, you know, one of the clear themes is that we, we want to produce the most amount of energy, and I'm talking about useful energy that we can deploy, like the thermal energy with the smallest amount of resource inputs. And again, nuclear power, it's not even a fair fight. Nuclear power fission produces orders of magnitude more with orders of magnitude less. So it scales. We can scale this up. We know how to do this. I've got lots of things kind of ridiculing renewable energy. I don't think it's worth my time to go through this because it, it is so patently absurd that for one thing, look at the look at what the dictionary defines as being renewable. Wind and solar aren't even close. They, they don't meet that definition in it, sustainable, renewable, green, clean. None of those are even close to reality for wind and solar and batteries. They, they are not green, not clean, <laughs> not renewable, not sustainable. It it it's a label and and they've gotten a lot of a lot of play for for free, really. I've got this article called Ever Heard of Gaslighting? And it starts out, it's just, I've kind of created these articles from threads that I wrote and I, you know, I use Substack as a platform. It, it's a great long form platform and it's free to me, free to you. This came out of a thread that I put together back in December or November. And it just occurred to me, I mean, 1970s energy policy, imagine 1970s energy policy being orders of magnitude better than 2020s energy policy. When France did what they did, they didn't have any windmills. They did not have any solar panels. They did not have excess transmission. They didn't need any of that. In fact, France, they had this, the Mesmer plant called for an enormous build out. They got partway through that and they ended up with so much electrical energy that was so low cost that they didn't know what to do with it. So France, they did a couple things. They turned around to their neighbors and they started selling electrical energy as 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 fast as they could to their neighboring nations. And then they also electrified the, they, they turned around to French society and basically, well, the economics work this way, right? If, if you, if your electrical energy rates go way down and you have abundant electrical energy, then it's the opposite problem that Germany has right now, right? 
You have Germany is deindustrializing itself and its electricity rates and are skyrocketing. And France had the opposite problem, right? And so it's just, it's absurd that we don't, the people don't see the power of the way France, France did it in during the Mesmer days. By contrast, the, the leading analysts are predicting that in order to meet these absurd renewable energy goals, like quote, quote, air quotes, right? We're talking about doubling the amount of copper the world produces in a decade. Like that is the only thing this will do is the more the governments put money into wind and solar and excess transmission is the cost of copper is going to skyrocket. It's just, it's inflationary because these markets, now governments are, are buying copper and other many, many other minerals at unprecedented rates and the mining infrastructure and the resources are not there. Oh, by the way, the same governments are saying, oh, we have these good copper and mineral resources off limits. You can't mine them off limits. No, no, no. You have to go after the the garbage resources, well, the lower grade resources you have and keep mining lower and lower grade resources because you can't have access to the high grade resources. So the lower the grade, the more energy it takes to produce. And this is kind of one of Mark Mill's big points that, that grades are falling because we we have to keep adding more and more energy to produce lower grade resources and it doesn't scale because the available resources are lower and lower and lower grade. The really good resources, the high grade resources like up in Alaska and Arizona in Greenland are legally off limits because we need to protect the environment, right? We, we, we can't destroy the environment through mining. So, it, it, it's lunacy that, that there's no coordination between any of this. So this is where we are. And then we get into this absolute absurdity about, you know, Canada is going to use wind energy to make hydrogen to sell to Germany <laughs> so that Germany can make electrical energy out of it. Dr. Kiefer has a whole thread about this. Th this is lunacy. So Again, all this chaos and lunacy. Why? Why do politicians do this? Because there's so much money to be made. There, it just there's so much money because the supply chains are huge. Let's look at uranium. One pound of uranium. When I wrote this, the market price was a, and this is unenriched uranium. This is granted. This this is just uranium ore, but one pound of uranium ore is forty eight bucks. Okay. So, but if you could, now the fast reactors, the, the Gen 4 reactors, a lot of these technologies actually will use straight yellow cake. That is fissionable material. It does not have to be enriched. So that is actually, in a Gen 4 reactor, could be, that is a fuel source for a Gen 4 reactor. We don't need to enrich it. One pound of uranium that costs us $48 a pound to mine has enough thermal energy. If we did fast spectrum reactors, and we don't have to enrich it, which is, this is this is not theoretical tech. This is actual technology today. One pound of uranium is enough energy. Think about all the energy that you consume in your life, in your daily life, you and me. North Americans, we consume more energy than anybody on the planet. Like there's, no, there's not even close. One pound of uranium is enough energy to power the average North American's consumption level of, of energy for 100 years. Put that in perspective. 100 years, one pound, $48. <laughs> I mean, let think about that, okay? We're really just being, what what's happening, and I, I have this other article that I kind of segue into here, is that in my judgment, what, what I see happening is that the supply chains for nuclear, for fission energy engines, the supply chain has so few inputs that th there's this myth that there is some kind of a nuclear energy lobby. And that is an absolute lie. There is no such thing as a nuclear energy lobby. It, it doesn't exist because the supply chain is again we're doing we're producing so much energy with such few with with such 
few resources that there's no money to be made in a supply chain. And if there's no money to be made in the supply chain, who's paying the politicians? The bigger the supply chain, the more people who benefit from it, the more people are paying politicians. So again, windmills, <laughs> solar panels, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of excess transmission that we don't need. It, it's underutilized transmission. It's, it's a ridiculous. Why is that being promoted? Because there is so there are so many billions of dollars at play in that kind of a scheme. There is no such thing as a nuclear power lobby, except one. It is us. It is the average, the consumer of these resources, us. We are the constituency. And it it really is the responsibility of every single person who understands how this works to become involved and become active. Because if you don't, nobody will. In fact, you're up against natural constituencies that are against nuclear power and has always been this. Because they know nuclear power, fission, is a killer. Fission will kill them, every other resource. You know, a natural constituency is is a constituency that would naturally support one, you know, a topic or some other policy. And so, you know, in 1942, when the first fission reactor was demonstrated to be practical, Enrico Fermi demonstrated this in Chicago. This was a this was this day was more important than the day that humans first discovered how to control fire. Fission releases six orders of magnitude more energy than combustion. It's transformational. Now, the problem is, again, it's good for us to make more with less. That's the ultimate definition of efficiency, right? Every economist will tell us this. AI will make us more efficient because we're going to produce more with, with fewer inputs, right? And, you know, the Industrial Revolution, humanity produced way more stuff with way fewer inputs. That's that's how this works. Well, nuclear energy fission is the same way. That fission produces orders of magnitude more with orders of magnitude less. Well, that's good for us, but then here it is when less is less. Okay. So except for a a few you know companies there uranium is so abundant in the world and it's so readily available that until this year, the uranium market price was like $25 a pound for the last decade. And there's no money to be made mining uranium. So, you know, again, this is just an example of how many uranium miners have just got, they go bankrupt. They, they don't make money because $25 a pound, it's just not enough money. So the supply chain for nuclear energy is, is so small that, again, it just doesn't generate the kinds of campaign contributions. That's my that that's what I see. So that's what this article is all about. I want to segue over to this article. So it kind of it it kind of flows from what we just went through with the gaslighting idea, right? Yep. So we have hey forty eight dollars to to power for is is the fuel cost to power my life style for a hundred years every day for a hundred years, the, the engine that will make that happen is called a fast reactor. And the United States, going back to the 1950s, when, when nuclear power came into being, it was assumed that uranium was extremely rare and would be very hard to find and very costly. That turned out not to be so. But at the time, there was a lot of effort put into how do we make uranium go for, how do we improve the fuel cycle so we can utilize uranium efficiently? So the United States developed, you know, again, on the R&D side, this idea of a fast reactor. So non-light water, fast reactors. And the United States science invented these technologies and the United States government invested quite a bit of money in, excuse me, in these technologies. It's called the breeder reactor, and breeding means that, that the reactor can take fissionable elements like thorium and through, through a fission process, 
turn those fissionable elements into fissile elements that will actually fission themselves. So it's, you're making more fuel. You, you put in X fission, pro, fission material and through because of the way it, these elements work, you know, U-235, it's fissile, sorry. U-235 is, is, quite, is a rare isotope of uranium. Most, most uranium is 238, which is more stable. But 238 is, can be fission, can, can be turned into fissionable, or fi, it's fissionable, it can be turned into, into fission elements, like plutonium. So this, uh, the, the fast reactor fuel cycle does not use water because we want to be operating in a much higher energy state with higher, higher energy. And so we can't put water in, we can't have a water moderated high, you know, fast reactor. Water, the reason we use water as a moderator is that the energy of fission is so high that if that the chance of of a neutron causing another fission is it it goes down in relation to the the speed or the energy so it also as you reduce that energy it goes up so what water does is it's called a moderator and it it slows down the energy of that fission and then it increases the chance of another fission happening so you can with water as a moderator you can use really low enrichments like 3%, 3.5% is common in a light water reactor. And with with a water moderator, that's that it, it slows those fissions down enough that it creates more fission, but it's only utilizing just a tiny bit of the energy potential of that uranium. In a fast reactor, it's a different idea. You want to use that high energy, but you have to start with a higher enrichment. I and mean, that's what that's the high assay low enriched uranium that people are going for right now. These the modern reactors are not a 3% enrichment is not enough. So when you have a a higher enrichment, you can physically put that uranium, the fuel rods closer together. When they're physically closer together, the chance of a of a of an a, of a fission causing the chance of a neutron causing another fission it increases because it's just about the density of the uranium, right? So, but you need to have it physically close together. These are really tiny fuel pins and they need to be physically close. If they expand and the distance between the fuel pins even in, increases just even a small amount, the, it's kind of like the light water reactor losing its water, like the fission slows down. Because it's just it it doesn't have it just it's physics. So the United States created this, you know, again, among many other ideas, but there was this EBR, this experimental breeder reactor two is the one that ran up in Idaho for like 30 or 35 years until <laughs> the Clinton administration. So this EBR2 reactor that Clinton killed. The Clinton administration, Al Gore killed this because, again, they they needed to spend they needed to save taxpayers so that we could invest in wind and solar. <laughs> this actual reactor that that Clinton killed is is the basis for the Natrium reactor. So again, if we had if we had spent the last thirty years, Russia did it. Russia took this technology; they copied it. And they created this BN program. They have this BN reactor program. They didn't kill it. We we only did one reactor. We did not do anything past EBR2. Clinton killed it because wind and solar were going to blow everything away. And that's what we needed. <laughs> and, and this EBR2 is costing $120 million a year to keep running. I mean, let alone, how about EBR3? Well, Russia has done, Russia took that technology and they have scaled it up and they have now 30 plus years of, and they, and iteratively they have created new fast reactors on this tech. And now Russia has created, oh, here it is, yeah. You know, we hear all this talk about, you know, nuclear, high level nuclear waste and 10 million years and we're all gonna die and all this, that's a lie. Russia took this same tech that we invented, that Clinton killed. 
that we didn't we did not we did not keep going with it. Russia did, and the date of this article is 2022. This is the Russian BN program, and the, and their current reactor is the BN 800 fast reactor. Russia last year loaded up their BN reactor in a new fuel cycle, and it's running on I think 80 percent MOX fuel. MOX fuel is used fuel. This BN reactor is literally burning up what the, it. So this is a little bit of a. This actually relates to an arms. The BN 800 process relates to an arms treaty that we have. We all agreed to get rid of our plutonium arms, Russia and the United States. Russia decided to do it through their BN reactor so they could make civilian nuclear power. We decided to just throw it away. So again, instead of just, you know, in, Russia did it the right way. I mean, ironically enough, Russia took our technology and they're schooling us. They are literally burning waste. If we had done this for the last 30 years, and again, this is just engineering. What, what designs work best? What, what materials work best? What configurations work best? And Russia has, has iteratively improved this reactor until they have the BN-800 that literally burns waste. And this, I found this article, this nuclear engineer was, and a whole bunch of scientists were against the Clinton administration shutting this down. What really should have happened is the United States should have, when Russia took this tech and started scaling it up, we should have said, hey, that's a good idea. We should, we should learn how to take EBR2 and make EBR3 and EBR4. And we would, we could be, we would actually be way ahead of the BN800 program if we had just stuck with it and we didn't and it found this other it found this other headline bill clinton to champion wind and renewables in chicago today because you know al gore inconvenient truth man i'll tell you what the inconvenient truth is that this administration killed our fast reactor program and here we are it's really absurd so and then we have this whole backstory on uranium one that the the Clinton administration allowed Russia to purchase, or not the Clinton administration, but the 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 Obama administration. Now there is a movement afoot for the Department of Energy to create this versatile test reactor, and it actually is intended to kind of be like oh. Hey, EBR two was great. We did. We don't have. We don't have a fast reactor in the United States. Actually, no. Outside of Russia, there's not a fast reactor. We can't even test materials. We can't even. We can't even take. We don't know how to do this because we abandoned it. If we had the EBR two running, we could use that reactor to test new materials, test new fuels, and all of those things. All of the R and D that goes into this. We could have been doing this for the last 30 years. The DOE is trying to, Congress is trying to solve this with this versatile test reactor. But of course, Congress can't fund it because we're spending, our budget is blown on wind and solar and transmission. I have this reputation of being anti-renewable, anti-batteries, anti, you know, anti-wind and solar, which... I think it's fair. I, everyone should be anti these things. They, mm -hmm. it, these are absurd. The, these are these are frauds. <laughs> it, if if you go back to the genesis of so, I started practicing law in the 1990s, and you know this is back in the integrated utility days, and this is back in the Enron. If you remember, California deregulated, and Enron was coming up into being. Enron Wind was a was a big project that they were working on. Enron invented something very clever back in the day, and they called it the renewable energy credit. That's what they called it. And all of this renewable energy that we see, this renewable stuff that we have even today, is based on the foundation of the Enron renewable energy credit. And if you if you look at what that is, and this was clear to us practicing law, energy law back in the 90s. What it it's just an accounting gimmick. So you know you you what happened is these big data centers like you know the like you know Facebook and ultimately Google and many others, 
eBay even, they had a PR problem because they were consuming so much electrical energy that they were being painted as destroying the planet because of coal. And they needed a PR campaign to solve that. And so they picked up on this renewable energy credit idea. It was candy. It, it, was, it was the hallmark of their whole strategy. What they did is they said, hey, we're going to go buy renewable energy credits so that we're all green, right? That we're, we're not burning coal anymore. And so it, it, it's an accounting gimmick. What they do is they take these, they take wind and solar generation and they make it up. They say, hey, well, this, this, wind, this windmill generated so many terawatt hours or, or gigawatt hours of electrical energy at random times whether it was actually able to be integrated into the grid or used, because it can't, very little of that energy can be integrated into the grid because of the way that it's generated, because of techn for technical limitations, it, the, it, it does, it's not actually used. It can't be used, but they don't care about that. They say, well, this windmill made, you know, one gigawatt hour of electricity and Google, or, you know, bought that, that, bought that energy, whether it, it it didn't actually use that energy, but it gets credit for it because it's an accounting assumption. It's just, it's, if you look at the footnote and how they do their accounting, it's all, it's a lie. It's a fraud. And this, this article kind of was, is, is one attempt I have at, at trying, trying to describe this concept of this renewable energy credit is absurd. The, uh, the whole basis of it is ridiculous. So what's happening is that electrical energy, like I said, it's a service. It's a real-time service. When you turn on your light, you need you need that the power is generated in the nanosecond that you use the power. It, it's it, it's the same. It, it goes like this. It it's used it. You use power, and it has to be generated at the same nanosecond. And when you put a random generator over here that says, "Oh, I'm I'm generating. Oh, I'm not. Oh, I'm oh I'm going. Oh, I'm not. Oh, the oh here I am. Well, the clouds came. <laughs> oh, I'm back. Oh, clouds came. You know, oh, the sun's setting. You know, and it it there's no core. It doesn't work that way. It's a electrical energy is a service. And I was trying to think of an analogy, and this is what I came up with because Uber is a service. Now, granted, now every Uber driver has to have fuel, right? Because they have to get their car around. So there's fuel involved, but it's a service. Like we're paying, we, you go on the app and you want to be picked up at a certain time at a certain location and you want to be delivered at a certain location at a certain time. It's a service. And it's almost like if you if you hijack Uber with like Fluber, like this Fluber service, right? Oh, hey, Uber, Uber is destroying the 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 world, and so you know it, it, we're gonna we're gonna create this. I mean, I go through this idea. Of, you know, there's fuel. What is fuel? What is a service? A service is not fuel. A service is 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 a service. I don't. It, I, I define it in here. And Uber is a mobility service, right? So again, electrical energy is a service, not a fuel, not a commodity, not a product, not a good. It's a service. And I kind of go through some resources on what this is. And and I, I bring this up from, we have, we have totally lost the plot. This is actually from the EIA, and they should know better than this, but they are so it's like U.S. renewable energy electric generation has doubled since 2008. Do you see? Do you see the chart? It's U.S. annual renewable generation by fuel type. <laughs> it's not a fuel. It doesn't work that way. Okay. So imagine, if you will, a car with a random accelerator. Okay. This is your car, and. It only works, and you don't. You can't even control the accelerator. You can only control the brakes. Okay, so you get in your car, and you're waiting for it to go, and it starts to go, and you're like, "Oh, it wants to go 90 miles an hour, but I'm in a 20 mile an hour zone. I gotta hit the brakes." Oh, I pulled. Nope. 
And then it's like, okay, now, but now I mean, I need to get on the freeway, right? So you're sitting in the merge lane and then it dies. Okay. That is, this is actually how a grid works. The, the integration of wind and solar into the grid is like that. It, it, it sounds silly, but that is literally, that is a very good analogy of how the grid works. It, those, the idea of a random generator and the grid don't, they can work to a point, but you get to the law of diminishing returns very fast. And then you actually wear out your generation resources that have to kind of be the accordion. You destroy your gas plants. And I've written a lot about that too. The, you are doing, you're having to do so much ramping on the gas plants to make up for the randomness that you are wrecking your, we are wrecking our gas plant fleet. We It's being destroyed. It's called ramping. Go, go, look at my articles about ramping. So, but if you take this, again, this is just an analogy, but if you have a car with a random accelerator, now we're gonna have a new business, right? It's called Fluber, it's random Uber, okay? So if you are, and it's in, and there's a fleet, right? We have wind cars and we have solar cars. So you get on your Fluber app and you and you request a car and the, the company has no control over when when the drivers show up. Like they just like maybe and so at any given time, you might be waiting hours for your next ride, or you might get on the app and you'll have 87 cars show up. Or one, you know, like, oh, 87 are coming. Like, that's my analogy. It actually, and then, but here's the thing. The, and you keep going with the analogy and it's like, well, okay, guess what? The government is going to require Uber to use Fluber cars, but they have to have a backup car at all times because that Fluber car might die. So think of all the extra infrastructure. So for every Fluber car that maybe picks somebody up, you have to have an Uber car behind it because if it dies on the freeway, you have to have the Uber car with the, with the human driver pick up the, the people and take them where they're going. That is not, that actually is a fair analogy. That's how the electric grid works. That's how absurd it is. It, it, it is literally that absurd. And we are, it, it makes my brain explode. That's why I write these articles because I otherwise I would have a, a stroke. And again, just, just at the end here, I'm just saying this is again, this is just how it works. You, you can't integrate these random generators into a grid. It doesn't, it's you can't integrate it. It's random. And that's just on a daily basis. What about on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? I mean, you end up with long periods of time where the random generators are are dead like they don't produce anything so then you have to have your your fuel-based generators have to be ready at 100 percent capacity ready to go at all times because you never know when the random generator is going to die so anybody who thinks that that this is a good idea or that this this is one of my favorite graphics of this is all the wind power on an hourly basis in all of Europe. So it's kind of like, hey, the wind is always blowing somewhere and it kind of evens itself out. That's an absolute lie. It doesn't work like that. So this is this is what I'm talking about. Like, you know, you're going down the, the road, you're going down the 20 mile an hour road. See, see those really high points? The system can't handle that much. So they actually have to put out, they curtail it. They say, hey, we can't, we can't only use this much. So we're gonna waste, those peaks get wasted. And the valleys, that's where you need your fuel generators to come in and make up sometimes 100% of the of, of the need. So again, one of the things I talk about a lot is when you see these charts or these claims that say, you know, this many generators is equivalent to so many nuclear reactors, that is a lie. All of the wind in Europe is equivalent to zero, zero nuclear reactors. Zero coal reactors, zero gas plants. I mean, look at the very bottom of the basement here. That's still not the same as even one fuel-based power plant. 
and then again you take the the highs off and you curtail that we that energy was not used it was wasted it it's just ridiculous i think i have another article about this from er supplebeta who's in ontario He's an energy economist, and he ended up creating these radial graphs that I think are very instructive. But this is plotting nuclear energy generation in Ontario is the blue over time, and then the red is wind. So again, the question is, why do we even need this? What, what is the red doing? What, what is this wind energy doing in Ontario, which Ontario doesn't even have a coal plant? Why are we curtailing our nuclear energy with, with wind? It's absurd. Like the integration of that is, <laughs> I, I'm speechless at how ridiculous it is, and how many people, how many, you know, ostensibly, you know, reasonable, intelligent people, some even Ph, the whole PhDs defend this. I I can't believe it. I'm just speechless. Any other points you'd like to make before we do wrap up? Anything else? So I think, you know, if you look at my sub stack, I mean, I kind of, I've decided to create, to assume this role as, you know, a civilization's lawyer. And I think that's a good point. I wanted to emphasize this. There is so much activism around protecting the environment and, and so many special interests that, that are activists in whatever, whatever niche they want. In, re in my experience, having practiced law for 30 years in environmental law and resource law, What's really happening is these these you know environmental groups, my experience, are being manipulated by the powers that be behind the scenes that are really just after their own self interest. So, the idea that you know these public interest groups are are you know simply looking out for the interest of of humanity is is not true in my experience. It's the opposite. What I see is a need for advocacy on behalf of, of humanity, advocacy on behalf of civilization, because civilization, by my definition, is what humanity needs so that we can live and we can eat and we can do the things that we need to do and have, you know, support our families and support, you know, do what we need to do as efficiently as we can. We need clothing, we need food, we need to live our lives, and there's very little advocacy for humanity that I see going on. Humanity needs energy. We need vast amounts of energy. Like I said earlier, you know, for in India just surpassed China in, in population. For India to have the same standard of living as China, India would need to quadruple its energy consumption. Where is that energy going to come from? Indians, like I said, in India, the cow dung market is valued at $4 billion. There are millions and well, hundreds of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in, in third world nations in India and Africa, because they are burning, you know, for their household use, they're burning things like cow dung, their lifespans. And, you know, that has dramatic direct health effects like that. That kills people. Breathing all that smoke constantly is 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 terrible. So. And that's just to cook their food. I mean, that's the most fundamental human need, right, that we have is to, to eat. So I just think that we fission nuclear energy is by far the only way and by far the best way that humanity has to meet our energy needs with the fewest impacts, the fewest resource inputs. And all this stuff about nuclear waste and, and you know, the, it it pales in comparison to the other the other benefits and the other and the negatives of other choices the of the other options you know, it's interesting you see you see nuclear power and immediately people go to the what about you know the what aboutism what about chernobyl what about what about and 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 again that it, there's no context for it, you know nuclear power is always like measured against itself in terms of the costs and, it, and it's not measured against other things. So there are, there are trade, no matter what we do, there are trade-offs and nuclear power vision has the fewest trade-offs by far. It's not even a fair fight. When you put all of the trade-offs in on balance, it's not even close. That's why I'm so passionate about nuclear energy and vision technology.
Thank you very much. I'm a big fan of your work and I encourage people to look in the show notes and read your Twitter and your Substack. but I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the invitation.